Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Mormon Stories Podcast. I'm your host, John DeLynn. It's February 13th, 2024, the day before Valentine's Day, for those of you who celebrate such things. And we are here for part two of a two-part series on this amazing book. Uh, the book is Chosen Path, the memoir, um, I guess, originally authored by D. Michael Quinn, but edited and annotated by the yeah. Barbara... Only authored by D. Michael Quinn. <laughs> <laughs> and we just did a, a simple copy edit, and then uh, myself and three other annotators annotated the entire book. Yeah, so that's Barbara Jones-Brown, everybody. Barbara, welcome back to Mormon Hi, Stories. Hi, thanks for having me back. <laughs> And uh, if y'all haven't watched the previous episode we just released with Moshe Quinn, D. Michael Quinn's son, and Barbara, uh, I really enjoyed it, and I and the feedback so far has been really good. So go check that out. Uh, I thought it would be really fun to uh, bring Sandra Tanner back, the Sandra Tanner. Hey, Sandra. <laughs> Hi. Welcome back. <laughs> okay. <laughs> y'all know Sandra. She and her late husband, Gerald Tanner, uh, were the founders of the Utah Lighthouse Ministry. Is that what it was called? Yep. And uh, for decades and decades, they not only sold books in uh, Salt Lake City, but they did lots of important Mormon history and scholarship that uh, up upon whose shoulders we continue to stand. Is that fair to say, Barbara? Absolutely. They're <laughs> pioneers yeah. in talking about Mormon history, that's for sure. And Sandra <laughs> sold her bookstore and is retired. But, mm -hmm. you know, I reached out to her and said, Sandra, we still need you. <laughs> so the other day I was just sitting here thinking, we need more Sandra. It's fine if she <laughs> decides she needs to be retired. But we uh, we still need her light and her wisdom. <laughs> so I reached out to her and said, Sandra, do you want to come on Mormon Stories? And she said... Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and so I gave her a reading assignment. I said, Sandra, your first reading assignment is <laughs> Chosen Path, the memoir, because it talks a lot about you and Gerald. And uh, Barbara, mm -hmm. you would, you want to tell your quick story of you were doing a, a little event, right? With, and so oh, was there. sure. Yeah. So we were doing uh, a book signing for this book, Chosen Path, at the amazing Benchmark Books here in Salt Lake City. And Sandra stood up. And we were doing Q&A, and I just asked anyone who knew Mike Quinn or who had read the book to share, stand up and share a comment. And Sandra stood up, and of course, in life, Gerald and Sandra and D. Michael Quinn were, can I say, arch enemies, Sandra? <laughs> well, on the other side of the issues. <laughs> um, but to hear Sandra stand up and say, I've been reading this memoir, and I'm I'm actually starting to like D. Michael Quinn and discovering that we actually had so much in common that I never knew about and learning things about him I didn't know and, and, and starting to like this person in spite of their differences when he was alive. Yeah. And since Sandra's forgotten more than we'll probably ever know collectively, <laughs> we want to uh, want to wring every bit of knowledge out of her for as long as she's willing to share. So Sandra, welcome back to Mormon Stories. Yes. <laughs> and and I want everyone to know this is a 550 page book that I got assigned to read. <laughs> and I've got all my little notes in it of all the different interesting pages, which I won't remember what they all mean <laughs> without looking at them. But at least I, it is my book is uh, marked. So I have. Well, you won't be able to see that, but there's red lines all over everything. <laughs> I, uh, it was a, um, it was a very interesting read. The first part of it, before he gets really into his research, uh, de deals a lot with his personal family stuff, and so it's not as applicable to uh, my studies. But it was interesting getting to see more of Quinn as. Um, a person in the context of his whole life. <clears throat> so it was um, a challenge to get through it, <laughs> but um, it it was interesting to see how uh, he was down in the Glendale, California area, and I grew up in the San Fernando Valley area, which is just uh, a few miles away. So... It was kind of like old home week, uh, reading some of his early experience in Mormonism, because I'm just a few years older than Mike, maybe three or 
three or four. He was born in 44. Yeah, I was born in 41. So I'm three years older. So uh, similar kinds of experiences growing up in Southern California in Mormonism, uh, which were good years for me. I, I enjoyed my early years in Southern California as a Mormon. And um, his mom and my family, all from Pioneer Stock, so we all grew up with a lot of base knowledge of Mormonism, uh, much of which was the PR version, or no, the PG, the G version. And it wasn't until later we realized there was uh, an R version of Mormonism. (laughs) But (laughs) uh, so to see Mike as a... Just a regular Mormon kid growing up uh, was instructive for me in, in helping to fill him out as a person. And I thought it was interesting reading about his mission and then his service in the, was he in the Air Force or Army? He was in Germany, and I think it was the Army. I'm getting a little rusty. Uh, <laughs> yeah, anyway, uh, he yeah. goes into... He was the, intel- in intelligence in, in yeah, Germany. In yeah, in the intelligence community, mm-hmm. which I thought was really interesting because he tells about how he wanted to go into the CIA and, uh, I guess, be super sleuth. And the guy is talking with him about... Uh, what you have to do when you're an agent. And he says, you know, there might be a time you're standing with somebody face to face and you have to shoot them. And Quinn's like, uh, maybe I want a different department. <laughs> so <laughs> he goes into a little different area of intelligence work. Uh, the struggles that he has uh, in his marriage and uh, I think most people uh, that know anything about him or his work know that he was gay And how from a child he knows this about himself. And yet as a child, he is given this promise by, was it his grandma? Well, his grandmother predicts that when when he's nine years old, he's, Mike Quinn is the kid that every fast and testimony meeting is getting up and bearing his testimony. And uh, so people in his ward start saying, oh, you're going to grow up to bring a, be a church leader someday, I'll bet. And his grandmother, when he's nine, tells him, I'll bet you grow up to be an apostle. And Quinn takes that very seriously, and he spends the rest of his life believing he's going to be an apostle someday. Yeah, I mean, really serious. He, he yeah. comments through the book, through his life, uh, that he's he had this um, reconfirmation of this through different blessings, through what different people said to him. Um, you know, if someone just talks about, oh, you'll go far, you've got great things ahead of you in the church, and that all feeds into this belief he has— that he's been chosen to be an apostle someday. So this drives him through his commitment to Mormonism to be the ultimate Mormon. And he strives so hard to do everything required of him. So there's there's a certain tragedy in the story of his desire is to be the ultimate Mormon, to be worthy of being an apostle And yet he has this inner struggle so that to be an apostle, you have to be married. You can't be divorced. Uh, I don't know. what. How high up can you be in the church and have a divorce? Do they let bishops get divorced? Sure, yeah. I mean, yeah. Yeah. Well, they call it. you with a divorce as a divorce. Yeah, you may, can be called as a bishop, but I don't think you, you can yeah. um, be a general authority having been divorced. Yeah. Yeah, well, I've never heard of anyone— in in higher church positions ever being a divorced person. I mean, you got widowers that end up marrying again and end up being spiritual polygamists, like the prophet leader of Mormonism today, but, but not divorced. And so he knows he has to keep his marriage together to fulfill this dream. And yet, as you read through his story, it's so sad. The one point in the book, he talks about He was so thrilled after years of struggle that they had just had the best period of their marriage ever. And then his wife tells him, no, it was the worst period of the marriage as far as I'm concerned. And they start talking of divorce. And it's just Quinn struggles with this because he knows if he divorces, it will be the end of the dream 
of being an apostle someday. But he also, uh, his other dream is to be the ultimate church historian. He wants to tell church history faithfully for Mormonism, but to answer the questions. And um, that's the other theme going through the book, is the struggle he has with trying to be faithful on retelling of church history and not get in trouble with the brethren. Because the brethren are always doing pushback that you can't say that, you can't tell that much, you can't tell that part, you can't see that document. There's just all these times through his life that the leadership is interfering or trying to squelch the research he wants to do, uh, making him edit uh, some of the biography and writings that he does because they're too uh, straightforward on telling problem areas. He does uh, an inside look at church hierarchy and how the brethren aren't all in agreement. <laughs> and it bursts this bubble of the average Mormon that everything's done uh, just the smoothest board meeting you could ever have where everyone's in agreement. And yet Quinn's writing out, no, they have these big disagreements. They don't like each other. Different ones are uh, saying behind their back uh, someone else. They don't like them. They don't like their policies. They don't like what they say publicly. And you have this infighting, which gets him in trouble as he tries to write his uh, different books. Do you have an observation on that part? I think you're right on. <laughs> and it, as as copy editor as copy editor of the book, it's 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 interesting. You know, I I know the themes that came out for me going through this again and again and again, and then hearing you pick up on the same themes. I'm like, oh great! You know, it's coming out to readers. These the, little themes. The origins so. and extensions of power, which yes. are both signature books. Yes. Highly recommended. Mormon hierarchy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, it's a three part can, series. Yeah. Right, because the financial one came third. Right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. The uh, those first two, I strongly recommend. Uh, they were a really formative part of my faith journey. They were written and published after he was excommunicated, correct? Oh gosh, they were they were published by Signature Books before I started, so I don't remember the yeah. exact years off the top of my head. But I'm guessing they came after. I think I think yes. all three of them came after his excommunication. Yeah. Yes, and and he was excommunicated as one of the September six in September of 1993. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Those are fascinating, and they talk about. Wasn't there the story of? Of uh, Hubie Brown when David O. McKay was getting up there in years wanting to rescind the priesthood ban in the late 60s. Yeah, they've been talking about it for years before it finally actually happened. But sure. The, and, and, and I the power think, dynamics between those who wanted it and those who didn't. Yeah. And I think with the, with the right people out of town, he almost got the votes necessary in the late 60s to overturn it. But then like Harold E. Lee or whoever came back in town and scuttled the deal, right? Yeah. I mean, that's the type of stuff Quinn was writing about. Right. Uh, I'll give you an example here of the early on when he gets uh, into his um, studies. So in 1966, he has a section in his memoirs called A Devout Freshman Shakes My Confidence. And he tells about how he had talked with LeGrand Richards, who was an apostle, uh, back in 1961. And um, LeGrand Richards had answered his questions about post-manifesto polygamy. And Quinn felt that he had adequately dealt with post-manifesto polygamy as not being a problem, not being an issue. Uh, and But then in 66... A student uh, comes up to him and talks to him about the problem he has with post-manifesto polygamy. Well, Quinn thought he had that all solved, but here comes this uh, fellow, Stephen E. Robinson, who goes on later to become a professor at BYU, yeah, I believe. Yeah, and he wrote the very popular book, Believing Christ. Yeah. yeah. Well, this is back when Robinson's a... Um, um, young student, I believe. Mm -hmm. And he comes up to Quinn and he says, 
My grandfather was a mission president who married two plural wives in Salt Lake City 10 years after the manifesto. And my family has a recommend from one of the marriages signed by President Joseph F. Smith. And so this Robinson is struggling. How do you put this in the history of the church when we were always taught that uh, the polygamy stopped in 1890. And so this gets Quinn interested in this topic. And post-manifesto polygamy then goes on to become a major issue from him, for him, and he ends up writing later a huge article in Dialogue on post-manifesto polygamy that's a classic. Did he just list all the post-manifesto polygamous that, that marriages he was aware that he could of, find? Yes. Yeah. And um, on, the, on this story about Stephen uh, was it Stephen E. Robinson or yeah. L? Okay, Stephen Same. E. Robinson. But he's upset because he's in a religion class, and Mike Quinn is in the class with him. And the professor is teaching at BYU. He says there were no polygamous marriages after 1890, and if they were, they were outside mainstream LDS approval. Um, you would have been excommunicated after 1890, all of them on. And so the Stephen E. Robinson, he's like, that's just not true. My my ancestors were mainstream active, faithful LDS, and they were married in, in, in 1900. And so that makes Mike Quinn start thinking, oh, what what's going on with this post-manifesto polygamy? Was it actually going on? Was it sanctioned by LDS church leaders as it was for quite some time? And um, he, he writes about that. And it's one of the subjects that he kind of says, okay, we need to start talking about this taboo subject. <laughs> yeah. So, so Quinn writes, I was deeply disturbed by what Steve told me about his grandfather's post-manifesto polygamous marriages. This didn't fit the explanation of Apostle Richards and traditional historians by B.H. Roberts and Joseph Fielding Smith that people entered post-manifesto polygamy without authorization of the First Presidency. I couldn't believe Steve's story, and without indicating my skepticism, I asked for his grandfather's name to look it up. So then he goes and looks it up at the genealogical library and finds the genealogy sheets and verifies, yeah, he took two wives after the manifesto. That all was true. So then Quinn says, this BYU student set me on a quest to understand post-manifesto polygamy and every other historical claim about the LDS church made by anti-Mormons. La la. Uh, in the process, I found that traditional Mormon historians were denying the existence of things that anti-Mormons could demonstrate even from Mormon sources. Mm. I felt that this was a great vulnerability for the average Mormon. I was determined to get to the bottom of every historical claim made by anti-Mormons and do what traditional historians had not been doing, acknowledging all the evidence and still come up with an explanation that was both honest and reassuring for believers. And this was in 19, 1960. I believe. Which is right around the time you and Gerald were starting up your stuff, right? We're so. doing all kinds of stuff at that point. <laughs> yeah, but the problem the problem for the historians through my whole lifetime that the Mormon church has faced is I don't see that they have good answers for the problems. They can give you an answer, but I don't see them as adequate. The problems are, are very deep and very complicated so that all the way through, Quinn and the different Mormon church historians have spent these last 60 years trying to write faith-promoting history, and they've done a lot of good research along the way. Obviously, though, for many people, the answers still are not strong enough because we see so many people still leaving Mormonism, even after all of the uh, research been done. And that's what the Brethren, why they have such a pushback with Quinn on his writing that, okay, Quinn, you may think this is faith-promoting when you tell all this, but most of the people who read this don't end up thinking that's real faith-promoting. 
Yeah. Well, I think what's fascinating, um, you know, this this tension that comes mm-hmm. out through the memoir between Gerald and Sandra and Michael Quinn is they were both doing the same thing. They both believed that it's important to talk about all of these difficult aspects of Mormon history, yeah. but with different end goals in sight. So Michael Quinn believed until he died in 2021. He was a believer. He believed in in Joseph Smith uh, as a prophet of God. He believed in the Book of Mormon. He believed the truth claims of Mormonism until his death. And so for him, he he thought it was important to share all these aspects of Mormon history in order to help Latter-day Saints stay in the church, you know, kind of inoculating them, if you will, you know, just it, let's get it all out there. Let everybody know it doesn't need to be faith uh, destroying. And then Sandra, correct me if I'm wrong, but you're in, you're in Gerald's goal or mission with sharing all of these things in, in Mormon history was to help people out of the church. Would yes. you say that's accurate? Well, whether they left or not, we wanted them to have informed decisions. Right. And we felt the evidence would lead them out, but many of our friends stayed. But I wanted them to make an informed decision to stay, sure. not just because uh, they their grandma told them the first vision story and uh, they were sure it was all true, and they didn't really know the problems with that story. It, it isn't that easy. And our very first struggles with the historians was over the first vision and um, led to a extensive research by the historical community over that next 60 years after we started in 59 writing on first vision problems. And uh, Mike Quinn later uh does his book, Early Mormonism, The Magic Worldview. Oh, that was an interesting thing I thought in the book, and I don't remember which page it is, but he tells that early on he goes to hear Eldridge Smith, the church patriarch, uh, show memorabilia from his, um, what would it be, great-grandpa, a great Ancestor. <laughs> uh, well, his ancestor, yeah, because uh, uh, he would have come from Hiram, Hiram. Smith, Joseph's mm-hmm. brother. But he had inherited uh, artifacts from the Smith family, and he had these magic tal- uh, these magic papers that were um, owned by Hiram Smith, evidently, and he would sh- uh, this elder Smith would show them at firesides and things. Mike saw those at one of these firesides and just tucked it away in the back of his mind. Oh, that's interesting, and didn't even think about it for years. He also was aware that Reed Durham, who was the institute director at the University of Utah back in the early 70s, had given a famous talk on Joseph Smith's Jupiter's talisman. But at the time, they thought it was a Masonic artifact, but it turns out to be a magic artifact. And Quinn was aware of that, but he had not put the pieces together that these were part of a bigger picture of the Smith family's involvement with the occult. And so it's not until you come up to the time of the Mark Hoffman documents, and Mark Hoffman starts his documents in 78, I think is the earliest one I know. I think his earliest one I think he brought to me on the um, uh, second anointing and uh, supposedly a document from the Salt Lake Temple, which is complicated. So if you want to read it, read our biography on Lighthouse. I guess it's in there. But uh, so Mike Quinn starts seeing these different documents that Mark Hoffman is, we now know, inventing but supposedly finding, that show connections to magic. And this gets Mike Quinn interested in the whole magic question of the early Smith family. Hmm. So he spends several years then researching all of that and eventually comes out with his book. Early Early Mormonism and the Magic Worldview, 
which incidentally won the Mormon History Association's Best Book Award in 1988. And then you mentioned your biography, Sandra Lighthouse. Um, it won about you and Gerald, mm. and it won the Mormon History Association's Best Biography Award last year. So incidentally, both yeah. books have won those awards. <laughs> this episode brought to you by Signature Books. <laughs> <I> guess. Yes. <laughs> but the Quinn's book, Early Mormonism and the Magic Worldview, was just a monumental study uh, and the brethren were not thankful that he wrote it. <laughs> so it just, I'm sure, caused them all kind of grief. But Quinn's philosophy was, if that's the way he lived it, then that's the way we tell it. And if the church could get going and survive with that being its story, then we ought to be able to survive with it being our story now. So... Uh, but he was a little more accepting of some of that than a lot of the average people. Uh, but Quinn's book, that was a really important study when he did the early Mormonism and the magic worldview. And and it still remains the starting point, I think. Anyone that's going to try to deal with that early period of Joseph Smith's life, it would be required reading Um Sandra, I'm, I'm curious, what did you... So it came out in 1988, and uh, that was a decade after you and Mike Quinn had had the, the conflict, right, yeah. over the, no. the secret pamphlet. Um, but what did you and Gerald think when Early Mormonism and Magic Worldview came out in 88? Oh, we just uh, were fascinated by it. Now, it had... Uh, its first edition came out during the Mark Hoffman... Uh, I can't remember just how the dates go on that, but the first edition had some, at least one of uh, Hoffman's documents. Forgeries. In it. Forgeries. Mm -hmm. And so there had to be a new edition done, uh, a bigger and better version. And um, But we were thrilled to see the research that he had done on it. Now, we were troubled by his ability to marry magic with traditional Christianity. And um, so other than that angle, <laughs> we, we were really impressed by the research he did. But that's the problem for the Mormon historian in dealing with Joseph's magic involvement is how do you put that together with the Christian uh, position of um, traditionally of rejecting magic involvement, and whether you make it white magic, black magic, I, you know, they people make differences. Anyways, um, the outer Christian community generally, outside of Mormonism, would, would find that problematic, that someone was involved in soothsaying magic rocks, uh, digging at night for buried treasure, binding spirits that would guard the treasure, and uh, doing incantations to get the treasure free from the spell and all. Uh, and Mike was able in his mind to meld it together, and it didn't bother him. Um, the One of the problems, though, from looking at it from the outside is okay, if you can say he could have had some sort of power and whether you say it's magic or God. The problem, though, is that they never found a treasure. <laughs> and so it isn't just that he's involved in the occult, but it's that he seems to be deceptive in using these things. And so how do we deal with that part of it? So... I'm not sure how Quinn reconciled all that in his mind, but he did a great service in pulling together all of the references and sources on that topic so that, like I say, I think it's a classic. If you're going to study the early years of the Smith family, it you have to read that. Whether you agree with it or don't agree with it, it is a primary text that you just can't write on that early period without reading them. And, of course, along that way is uh, Dan Vogel's books, another 
uh, commercial for his signature books. <laughs> <laughs> but Dan Vogel's books, also dealing with the early period of Mormonism, are just crucial. And I think when you put together Dan Vogel's works, uh, Brent Metcalf's works, uh, Quinn's works, these are all just paramount for anyone going through those uh, the early years of Joseph Smith. Of course, Dan uh, Vogel goes on to do that whole series of uh, early Mormon documents. But, that, that's right. Mm -hmm. And what, five volumes or six volumes of that? I don't know. I think it's, yeah. I should know, but it was a long time <laughs> it's, ago. It's half a bookshelf, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Of, uh, I think it's, I want to say it's four, but. <laughs> it, yeah. It's a lot of volumes. It's a lot of volumes. Sandra, I'm curious, you know, whenever... You could say critic or apostate or honest history teller, however you want to choose it. It almost seems like whenever one of that type of person emerges in the public Mormon consciousness, at some point, a faithful, oftentimes on the church's payroll person emerges to kind of be the foil. And so, you know, it's interesting to me that you and Michael, you and Gerald and Michael are are of similar ages no. And you're you're starting to study and ask questions about Mormon history, you know, within a two or three year period of each other. Um, now I don't know exactly when Quinn goes to grad, you know, undergrad in Yale. Um, exactly the years he would. So he goes to BYU for his undergrad. He goes to the University of Utah for masters, and then he goes to Yale for PhD. And do we but know this the is all in that. So he starts BYU in the 60s, okay. serves a mission. Um, and then, yeah, so late 60s, early 70s, okay. he's, at, he's at the U, and then he goes to Yale in the 70s. So I'm wondering well. when Quinn for you, Sandra, would have emerged as a potential foil. And it sounds like it's when this Dr. Clandestine pamphlet comes out, and Gerald's just trying to figure out uh, who wrote it, but he knew, Gerald knew enough to go to Quinn's Yale dissertation to find the, the tells in the dissertation. So I'm wondering when Quinn came into your and Gerald's mind, your consciousness as sort of a church paid foil to your criticisms of the church. If was it before the pamphlet and like, and if so, when that that started happening, when you started realizing he was trying to neutralize your work, basically. Well, Gerald was aware of Quinn's dissertation, but I'm not sure just what brought that to his attention. I, and it may be through early uh, issues of uh, BYU studies or dialogue or something. I don't remember when Quinn's earliest articles would have started appearing. Do you know? I think that Quint, so when, when this pamphlet came out challenging your work, Mormonism, Shadow, Shadow or Reality, um, Quinn was working for the church history division for Leonard Arrington. My guess is, is Gerald probably was like, was looking at all the historians working there to try and figure out who had written this anonymous pamphlet and then started reading their works. So it, you know, it mentions this in your biography, yeah. uh, Lighthouse, how Gerald sees these really weird Latin phrases in that anonymous pamphlet. So I think he probably started going through all the historians working in the church history division, reading their works. And then when he saw that really weird Latin phrase... Virgo. Propter hoc post, something whatever. like yeah, that. Yeah. Um, well, that that's was, when he figured it out. It was it was Quinn. Okay. Yeah. Well, we know from both Quinn's memoirs and from uh, our uh, biography that Ron Huggins wrote about us, the Lighthouse. Uh, I think Gerald was already aware of Quinn, and he may have even already have read his dissertation, um, but. The uh, guess that it was Quinn came the year before when uh, Gerald was friends with Reed Durham, the institute director that did the paper on the Jupiter talisman. But <clears throat> Gerald had got to be friends with Reed Durham, and they had talked at different times, sharing about different areas that they each were researching. Not that... Uh, um, 
I don't want to give the impression that Reed was sympathetic to our point of view, but it's just like Gerald's friendship with Ogden Kraut, the polygamist. Gerald was always interested in talking with anyone who was doing factual history, no matter what side they were coming from. They all want to see the same documents, sure. <laughs> even if they come to different conclusions. So Reed had already mentioned to Gerald that the church historian's office was thinking of doing a rebuttal, and the name of Michael Quinn had come up at that time as a possible person to do such a thing. And Gerald had just made notes about it and put them away in a file and uh, hadn't really thought about it until the anonymous historian's uh, response to Shadow Reality came out. And so that then drove Gerald back to going through his files trying to find that note he'd made. And when he saw that the name Mike Quinn was on his little notes, he thought, oh, I better look into him because he may be the one that did this. Mm -hmm. But at the time of the rebuttal to us, I think there were other people trying to figure out who it was as well, and and they had some thought that it might have been, um, was it Bush or Bushman? Bushman, Richard Bush, Bushman. Bushman might have yeah, been one of he the was authors. Suspected. Yeah, yeah. And Arrington had been suspected, but uh, because Gerald had this clue that maybe Mike might be involved. He went back and looked at his thesis again and saw all these Latin phrases in it. But the one that stood out was the uh, post hoc ergo proctor hoc. That's it. <laughs> we got to remember Who that, Barbara. That? We gotta... I will never remember that. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's a logical fallacy, I think. <laughs> yeah. So Charles reading through the anonymous historian, they got post hoc er ergo proctor hoc. And, and so Charles like, ah, okay, there's a clue. Yeah. Uh, even reading his uh, memoirs, he doesn't put in the post hoc ergo one, I don't think. But yeah, he, he never he never figures out how Gerald figured it out that he knew it was Mike. <laughs> He's just but, shocked that Gerald calls him and says, yeah. so but how Mike does use the Latin phrases several times in yeah. his memoirs. Oh, yeah. Not that particular one but again, here, but he does. He, he loves yeah, to read Latin, along here yeah. every once in a while. I'll hit one and I thought, oh, that's a Quinnism. <laughs> It's true. Uh, what do you think about the confrontation as related by D. Michael Quinn in his book with Gerald? Did it, uh, did it feel accurate? Did it feel embellished? Did it feel one-sided to you? Of what Quinn writes about? Yeah, the... Quinn recounting his confrontations with Gerald. Well, I think he sees Gerald as having more sinister motives than, than I see Gerald as having. <laughs> but... Uh, like he, when Gerald later prints Quinn's talk he gave at BYU on being a Mormon historian that got Quinn in trouble, uh, Quinn comments that he thought Gerald was just retaliating against him for Quinn writing the rebuttal against us. And I don't think Gerald thought that way. Uh, I, mean, to, I think in Gerald's mind, it was two different incidences. The, Quinn had done the pamphlet, but then on this talk, Gerald thought it was important he was afraid the talk would be squelched and people wouldn't see that their own historians felt there was a problem with the way the church handled history, that their own historians were calling for an open history and the church was pushing back. So his idea was that this talk needs to go out to a broader audience. And I don't think in his mind it was really a retaliation a revenge, a revenge kind of thing. Yeah. Gerald didn't really think that way. Yeah. Uh, that's why he could be friends with different people that had different beliefs, believers, uh, unbelievers. I mean, we were friends through the years with atheist historians, uh, polygamist historians. You know, the the whole gamut. Uh, I mean, I was kind of friends with. T. Edgar Lyon, who did the research on the, a lot of the work on the Nauvoo restoration stuff. Mm -hmm. But, uh, and he used to stop in at the bookstore. Really? Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. My my dad, who was very devout, would, he, he had three haunts when he came into Utah. He'd visit Benchmark Books, Ken Sanders, and Utah Lighthouse Ministry. He loved to hang out with the Tanners. <laughs> That's right. Fine. So, I mean, we, uh, although we're painted as, you know, these ogres, um, 
we actually could sit down and have a, a good discussion and talk with people from different points of view. Yeah. Gerald was kind of like a kid in a candy store talking to different historians. Because these are my people. These are people that know the documents I'm looking at. It's someone to talk to that, you know, most of our friends think we're crazy. And uh, I can't... When you get deep into Mormon history, there it narrows the field of how many people, <laughs> how many nerds are interested. How many nerds in it? are there <laughs> that we can talk it's about so all true. the nitty gritty of? Did you read this page? You know <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and my dad used to say the same thing. He used to say, "These are my people. <laughs> For These sure. are my fellow nerds." <laughs> For sure. So, do you remember once Gerald had once Gerald discovered D. Michael Quinn was the author of Doctor Clandestine? Had the confrontation. Oh, and by the way, Quinn lies to Gerald and yes. says he's not the guy. Did Gerald buy it? Did Gerald not buy it? Do you remember? Oh, no. Gerald was sure he was lying. When Arrington lies to him as well and says he doesn't know anything about it, Gerald felt they both were lying to him, but he had no way to prove otherwise. But no, he wasn't persuaded by the, either of their comments that they had nothing to do with it. He realized the game was, you know, uh, these guys' jobs are probably on the line. They have to lie. And uh, so he's disappointed in them. Uh, and I think they were disappointed in themselves. Yeah. I think Arrington and Quinn both were remorseful that that they had to lie to Gerald because there's a certain irony in this whole thing. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> we're the big liars putting out anti-Mormon stuff. We're like telling stuff. the truth. We're the truth tellers, but we're lying about truth telling. Yeah, I mean, and, and Quinn mentions that in his memoir. He he talks about his regret in lying about it. And he um, mentions lying for and, the Lord, basically. Yeah, uh, that's the start of lying for the Lord. I mean, he doesn't Lord. use that term. <laughs> Not but, exactly. But he but, does express regret. But especially Leonard Arrington in Le Leonard Arrington's uh, diaries that we've also published, yeah. he, he writes there that he... Uh, regrets having to lie, but he says it's something I had to do for the church or the king. He doesn't use the term lying for the Lord, but yeah, he says but he it's does something that a, I have to do. He uses a similar term. A similar term. Yeah. 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 yeah absolutely. Yeah. So um, they both regret it, but then I asked Sandra, did they ever apologize to you? And no. she said, nope. <laughs> <laughs> no, it never came up in conversation. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, but it, it is kind of ironic that 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 situation came about. Yeah. I always felt okay. Wait, sorry. I'm sorry. He okay. says life for yeah. God. Yeah, right. Life for life God. For God. Yes. Life for God, not life for the Lord. So that's pretty close. <laughs> oh, it's yeah. very close. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And does Quinn say re re that? You maybe read that sentence. Does he say that he? It says, as advocates of the new Mormon history, we were caught in the. I need my glasses. We were caught in the tangled web of our best intentions of faith. I feel embarrassed empathy for LDS headquarters and its generations of compromising defenders. In his plan um, account, in his plain account of Christian perfection, Methodist founder John Wesley had described such compromise as the quote, life or God. Right, yeah. I knew it was up like that. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. And he's quoting John Wesley. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, See, another th interesting thing on that Quinn pamphlet is uh, when all this stuff comes out, then you have uh, in 1978, he gets uh, Quinn gets a death threat because oh, yeah. <laughs> from uh, one of our fans, I guess. Uh, <laughs> he, he, Quinn writes. I became terrified for myself and family when a man phoned our house tonight asking about the anonymous response. He threatened to blood atone me for this attack on the Tanners. <laughs> I quickly changed our number, kept it out of future phone books, and left it unlisted at 411 information. <laughs> so uh, he was, he goes, he, wait a minute, he goes on, he says, uh, I, I couldn't do anything about the publicity and felt it really anxious about being murdered by some anti-Mormon crackpot. <laughs> well, 
Let's talk about the other side of that. <laughs> we yeah, were always in threats. the phone book. We sure. were always, yeah. uh, you could always find our address or phone number. And we were always worried about some Mormon crackpot <laughs> that <laughs> might decide they're going to help God out by getting rid of the opposition. When people have come to me and said, John, aren't you afraid to do Mormon stories that, you know, someone might hurt you? I'm like, well, Michael Quinn and, Ger you know, Sandra Tanner are still alive. <laughs> they so. survived it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we survived it. <laughs> so, like, yeah. once, it, once those canaries in the coal mine drop, then <laughs> there you go. I'll start to get worried is what <laughs> yeah. I would say. <laughs> and, I, and I would just recommend, so we had just published Lighthouse, this biography of the Tanners, we, as I'm editing Chosen Path, and it was so fun to, like, read what Mike is writing, his side of the story, and then the Tanner's side of the story. So if people want to just really get into They're this companions. intrigue and this conflict of what's going on in the 70s and 80s in Mormon history, yeah. read those two books together. It's it's fascinating. So Sandra, after after you, Gerald and you know confronted D. Michael and D. Michael lied, and Gerald knew that D. Michael had lied. From that point forward, did you and Gerald think of him as a foil to what you were trying to do? Was he a nemesis? Did he even rise to that level of prominence and continue at that sort of level of prominence in your minds or, or not? Well, we kind of viewed him as a little more fair than, than the true opposition. Uh, I mean, the other side would have been uh, Apostle Packer, <laughs> <laughs> who was Quinn's arch nemesis. They yeah. were, yeah, yeah. So that's all the way through the book too. Is Quinn's struggle with uh, Apostle Packer is always on a witch hunt to uh, uh, subvert his research some way or stop his career or something. It's just uh, uh, quite. Uh, a different look of general authorities than the average person would have of the men at the top. And um, and Quinn saw him as someone different than the rest of the men. He, he had fond memories and associations with different church leaders, but not Packer. He... He had a real struggle. <laughs> That's understating it, Sandra. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Quinn's, um, as as you mentioned, uh, there were some leaders he really looked up to and had a great relationship with. Uh, one of them is President Spencer W. Kimball, very close with him, saw him almost as a father figure. And then also uh, Marion D. Hanks who was a general authority in the LDS Church for 40 years. I think Hanks um, succeeded... Woodbury as mission president? Yes, in, he comes in. in yeah, so he was D. Yeah. Michael Quinn's mission president in the British mission. Uh, incidentally, Marion D. Hanks was also Elder Jeffrey R. Holland's mission president, the young Jeffrey R. Holland's mission president, and um, Quentin L. Cook, yeah. who both of those uh, two men went on to become LDS apostles. They are today. and uh, But Quinn was also in that same mission. So Marion D. Hanks was hugely influential in their lives and in, in Quinn's life. And instantly, we are going to be publishing the biography of Mary D. Hanks very soon. Nice. This spring by signature. Mm. So, wow. Yeah. Uh, I thought it was interesting in the book when it talks about Quinn, uh, not Quinn, but Arrington being demoted and then is sent down to BYU to run history department uh, things down there. And, um, uh, Mike Quinn talks about how Arrington felt about uh, being taken out of the historian's department and sent to BYU. And Arrington makes some comment to the effect that, uh, well, that now we can just be concerned about writing real history and we don't have to worry <laughs> about uh, being under the gun as the official church answer on everything. That when you're the church historian, Everyone's looking to you for the church official answer. And I think he felt a sense of relief of not carrying that burden because that implies it with it, <laughs> that you give more faith promoting slants to things than he felt comfortable doing. And by going to BYU to do f further history, I think he felt he was more free to... Um, 
tell it like it is and to, uh, although he still was trying to be faithful to Mormonism, but to be more frank about the warts and wrinkles in Mormonism and not gloss them all over as though everything was 100% uh, beautiful. Yeah. Quinn also says Quinn also says about that incident he says Leonard's optimism just broke my heart just made me want to yeah. cry ever yeah. the optimist and I did I I I'm friends with um Leonard's daughter Susan Arrington Madsen and she told me actually her father was just devastated mm. by that um but Leonard did tend to be I've I've read through much of his diaries he did tend to be really optimistic always about things almost boyish and his Almost. optimism. Yeah. 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 Sandra, did did D. Michael Quinn ever come to your store? Or mm. did y'all ever meet at MHAs? Or did you have any direct conversations after that phone call with Gerald throughout your life and his that you remember? Well, there were some different times when he'd give a paper at Sunstone or Mormon History or something that where I might have asked a question. Uh, and not questions to trip him up, just questions about historical items. And, um, uh, well, for instance, um, and I don't remember if this was Mormon history or what, but he was talking on post-manifesto polygamy at one of these uh, symposiums or conferences. And I asked the question of him, and I'm sure he knew who I was. Uh, and most people recognize me when I'm around at Mormon history. Uh, I asked him if he had carried his research beyond that first generation of people that practiced polygamy after the manifesto. Did you do any research on the next generation? Did their children continue with, did any of them continue with polygamy? And he said, uh, no, he hadn't. Uh, been able to get into taking it another generation down. And I commented that the reason I brought it up is that um, my great-grandpa was, um, what was his name? <laughs> Walter Young. Uh, my grandpa was Walter Young. He was the son of Brigham Young Jr. And Although Brigham Young Jr. married my grandma, great-grandma, before the manifesto, it was in 1887, but it was during the period when the church uh, was, uh, all the leaders were in hiding uh, for living polygamy. It wasn't a time when uh, <laughs> it was okay with the government be, to be taking more plural wives, but he went ahead and took uh, this plural wife be, uh, in 1887. But... What we didn't know until after my grandma died going through her papers is that he had married at least one or two women post-manifesto in polygamy. And then my great-grandma evidently was asked to go into polygamy and... Uh, uh, my gr and my grandma was asked to go into polygamy by Walter, who was the son of this apostle who was raised in a home that was a product of uh, post-manifesto polygamy in the family. And so my grandpa uh, had asked my grandma if he could take a plural wife. And so she has this great story of having a vision where uh, God shows her that they're not to go into polygamy. And so she tells Walter this, and she thinks this puts an end to it. Well, then when we go through my grandma's papers after she died, we find this postcard that's addressed uh, on my, uh, to my beloved husband, Walter, and blah, 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 and hope you can see the kid, the boys want to see you, blah, blah, blah. And then it's got this name. It's not anybody we know. This is a postcard for some woman writing to Walter <laughs> about, uh, hope you can come see the boys. And um, we have no idea who this person is. <laughs> it's postmarked in the town we know they lived in. It's a postmark where my uncle was born in the same area and that. So we know they lived there. So who's this woman that says, Walter, this postcard uh, about coming to see the boys? So 
uh, the assumption is that it was a post-manifesto polygamy. This would have had to have been after 1900. And so I'd ask Quinn about, did you do the next generation down? And he said, no. But my reason for asking was that it looked like my family, where you have a general authority son, had continued polygamy after the manifesto, after 1900, to continue it down. That, which I think is still an interesting thing. I don't know how well anyone could research it, but I would be curious how many of the people's descend, uh, next generation felt they had to live polygamy after the second manifesto even. Yeah, so um, as you mentioned, Mike uh, did this dialogue article on that, and he also, his magnum opus was supposed to be two books on post-manifesto polygamy. And if you'll recall, that was the first thing as a teen uh, and, and then as a student at BYU he's, that makes him start questioning things like in, in church history that aren't talked about. But anyway, so his magnum opus was going to be these two volumes on post-manifesto polygamy. He writes about it in his memoir. And I will just share that um, his children found what he had done on those two volumes. And I've um, been in talks with them about taking those, editing them, and publishing them. So we may have uh, one more or two more books from D. Michael Quinn on his work on post-manifesto polygamy. That's fun. <laughs> yeah, and I asked that question, Sandra, because it just seems like y'all would have been natural collaborators in, Not in all the work you were... <laughs> Yeah, because you had different end goals, Yeah. Right? Well, I think but there would have... both wanted to discern the truth right. about the history. And right, have... but with different... Ends yes, in yes, mind, yes, Mike yes, to keep yes. people in the church, Sandra and Gerald to say, "Well, maybe help you out." No, yeah. no, but I, I guess think... I'm saying, but I guess I'm saying, Sandra just got through telling us 30 minutes ago that she and Gerald didn't care. They, she would have yeah, friends of believers, informed, non-believers, yeah. atheists, sure, Christians, yeah. non-Christians, just sure. because, at least for Sandra and Gerald, it didn't matter what the the faith politics were. Right. But I guess we're saying maybe for Michael it would have. Well, it would have been a little more awkward uh, because it had been such a personal um, issue between Gerald and Mike. And maybe Mike was embarrassed? No, I, well, I, don't, I think Gerald would have felt uncomfortable with... Uh, Hanging around Mike? With... with being able to view him that neutrally, <laughs> like he yeah. did with Ogden Kraut, the polygamist, yeah. or or talking with Reed Durham, because they had not taken any written stand to denounce us or yeah. call us out. And throughout Quinn's memoir, he says throughout the memoir, he does not like the Tanners. Yeah. Yeah, so, he, he, he does not like the Tanners, and, and that never changes. Yeah, so I, I think it would have been too awkward. But I think that that he and Gerald, had there not been the pamphlet, uh, would have had a lot of common ground in their research. Well, but like, I, you, like uh, you said, the the early Mormonism and the magic worldview and the origins yeah. and extensions of power, yeah. y'all were cheering him on, I'm yeah. sure, right? Well, we carried his books in the bookstore, which got us <laughs> in trouble with the faithful Mormons, uh, Lou Midgley. Uh, came in and wasn't it Lou Mitchley that came in yeah. and <laughs> castigated me one day for carrying Quinn's books. What? <laughs> Lou Mitchley was an LDS apologist and Quinn couldn't stand him either. <laughs> no, 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 I took classes from Lou Mitchley. Oh, really? Year. Yeah, so I knew him. Yeah, huh, yeah. interesting. Yeah, yeah he's, he's all through the book. Yeah. Oh, he is. Yeah. He came in one day and uh, really carried on with uh, how could I handle those books by that gay man oh. and and it was much more vulgar than that or I shouldn't say vulgar necessarily but but more caustic wow. and uh, I just said look uh, <laughs> I don't know the fa family situation of most of the authors of the books in my store uh, that's not my issue of what their family dynamics is Uh I go by the research, and he's got a lot of good research, so that's what I'm looking at, yep. even though we don't have the same conclusions. But that was true of many of the Mormon historians that we sold in our bookstore, that I could uh, deal with the fact that they came to their different conclusion at the end because they had valid historical research in the book. So... Uh, we, in a sense, were champions of Quinn's 
after the his uh, little pamphlet against us, in that we uh, sold his books and recommended his books to people. If they asked me about like Mormon hierarchy stuff, I tell them, "Look, here's the books you need: Mormon hierarchy, origins, extensions of power." You know, and so it was a awkward friendship, but we didn't know each other personally. Hmm. So makes sense. What a weird thing for Midgley to, to. I mean, the fact that you were well known apostates that he would come in your bookstore and tell you not to, to, sell to tell you what books you should and books. shouldn't publish. It's like it was. It, he came in with a deliberate motive of trying to get me angry. He wanted a confrontation that he could go boast about how belligerent and mean the Tanners are. He went around to different uh, critical sources and would, I mean, he was famous for this, of trying to get a rise out of people. Mm -hmm. And so he was just being very rude to me and very um, dismissive and just snide. But this is when Gerald was going into his Alzheimer's, and I think this is in our Lighthouse book. Um, Dear sweet Gerald, he was in the back and heard Mitchley ragging on me and thought he was being uh, rude to me. And so he comes in to save the day and opens the door to the bookstore and tells him, uh, I think we've heard enough. I think it's time for you to go home. And he opens the door for Lou to leave. And so he later writes this up on the Internet. It's still up on the Internet, I'm sure. Uh, the day that Gerald Tanner threw him oh, out of the bookstore. And uh, it just was so funny when I read that. I thought, uh, you know, here's milk toast Gerald opening the door <laughs> and saying, Throwing you I, we're done, you're leaving. Yeah. That's so interesting, your relationship with Midgley, because, yeah, Quinn writes in the memoir about how he could not stand Lou Midgley. Yeah, interesting. Well, he w he was the so I think he saw himself as the champion of the true cause, and anyone that was a fraction off from what he perceived to be the truth was his enemy, and he would just set out to deride or dismiss or uh, start talk about the person to diminish them in other people's eyes. But he had quite a bad reputation in that regard. <laughs> yeah, I was like Hunibly, then Midgley, then Daniel Peterson. Like there's a long, that'd be a fun book, is the, the history of Mormon apologists, kind of prominent, sharp-elbowed Mormon apologists. That'd be Do you want to write it, John? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. Okay, so, um, well, that's classy that y'all were willing to recognize his value as a scholar and help him sell books, even though he yeah. had done y'all a dirty. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's nice. So um, any uh, other other important reflections, like, so Arrington and, you know, the, the church history department gets kind of shut down. Quinn goes to BYU. There's the Hoffman Arrington stuff. Arrington goes to BYU, not Quinn. Didn't they both? No, Quinn. Um, he well, was, Quinn went to BYU, but not at the time that Arrington. Yeah, he went didn't down go there. with Arrington's. He went. Yeah, later. I think he was at Yale. He Quinn later becomes a professor of history at BYU. He's okay, hired. Okay, sorry. Yeah, yeah but no, that was a different okay. time. That was a different time. <laughs> it's okay. Yeah. Okay, okay. But he ends up being a professor there later. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, professor of history. Got it. Okay, and Arrington didn't become a professor of history when he went to BYU? No, he, no, he did as okay. well. But it was like the the whole, um, what was called Camelot, but the, the church history division at the time is shut down. And it's in 1981, which incidentally is when Signature Books was started. <laughs> and that was intentional oh. um, by the owner. But nice. um, And they're sent down to BYU, kind of demoted, if you will. And they're with, I think it's the, called the Joseph Fielding Smith Institute or the Joseph F. Smith Institute. I always forget which F. Um, I think it's Fielding. But yeah, it's Joseph Fielding Smith Institute. And I think Quinn is um, either at Yale or anyways, when Quinn finishes his PhD at Yale, then he starts applying for professorships and he's hired by BYU to be a professor of history. Yeah. So it's not with like um, So there was history. a gap between him leaving 
the church history department and him joining BYU. Yes, exactly. Okay. Well, Sandra, <laughs> did you notice that, and I think we talked about this with Moshe, Barbara, mm-hmm. that Quinn sort of attributes the whole Dr. Clandestine fiasco as the final undoing of the Arrington administration. Yeah, Quinn says he believes that in his memoir. So I looked at Arrington's diary for the same time, and Arrington's writing about being sent to BYU. He doesn't say anything about the pamphlet. He writes about the pamphlet. He writes about being figured out and discovered by Gerald and how he's embarrassed that he lies about it and so forth. But Arrington doesn't say that that incident is the reason why he's demoted. And if you look in Arrington's diaries and also in this memoir, there's all kinds of conflicts going on between Leonard Arrington and G. Homer Durham, who was the general authority advisor over the church history division. So I think there were a lot of things, but in Quinn's mind, it's him. He's the reason why Leonard's demoted. What did you think about it? Did did that strike you as interesting, Sandra? Uh, Yeah, I noticed that, but I... With Quinn, uh, all along in reading his story, there's so much other stuff going on around him that um, there's a a bigger story to view the Camelot years and what's going on through Arrington's period covers a lot more events than just what Quinn's life covers. And so if you wanted to get a real view of that time period, there's uh, several books you'd have to read um, to to flesh that out. Arrington's uh, diary, biography, whatever, uh, would be one of the things you'd have to add to Quinn. But I think you also would need something like our lighthouse to give you the uh, some of the uh, conflicts that they don't talk about. So there were a lot of conflicts going on. I mean, we had our lawsuit with Andrew Ehat over the Clayton Diary thing, and then the church sued us in uh, 1999, 2000 time period uh, over the church handbook stuff. There, uh, you have the September not, uh, 6 fiasco, um, which Quinn touches on, but very uh, briefly, I felt in his uh, memoirs, that's a more complicated story than just what he dealt with of all the different people that were involved. Well, he gives a little bit of a run through of the different people, but there was so much uh, going on in that time period in so, on so many fronts. The church must have just been leader that must have been tearing their hair out of these uh, little fires that are popping up all the time all over the place on different aspects of church history, different aspects of theology, <clears throat> on feminism, uh, gay rights. It isn't just history. There's uh, the black issue, the priesthood issue, uh, the... Um, just general different scholarship, uh, scholarship on their uh, scriptures, uh, challenges to the Book of Mormon, challenges to the Book of Abraham, challenges to the Joseph Smith's uh, translation of the Bible. There were just so many different areas that were being challenged. It was like you could just put all the topics of Mormonism on a dartboard, put on a blindfold and throw the dart, and you would hit something that was being written about or people were worked up about or people were getting fired over <laughs> through that whole time period. So I think Quinn has a little bit of tunnel vision on seeing his participation as uh, as a heavier weight that there were, he was a factor, but there were many other factors. And like the September 6th thing, there was, each of those people had their own struggles with the brethren and the church and with research and history and all. So that um, Quinn might have felt that his dealings with us were the final blow, but I would say it's one of them. It, it is. There was a whole uh, ream yeah. <laughs> of papers you could have written on uh, other 
problem areas that were facing the church at that time that brought things to the conclusion of we got to shut down the church historians department. Yeah. I think that kind of comes out throughout the memoir. Quinn sees, and of course it's it's him telling him his, his own story, story right? Yeah. And it, each one of us, if we were write, to write a memoir and autobiography, we would be, we would be the center of that yeah. that story, well, sure. right? Yeah. But he does tend to see himself as the center of everything that's going on. Yeah. So, what was it like, Sandra, to have been on the receiving end of Michael Quinn's apologetics? You being a target, you seeing him as a faithful historian that you were cheering on. Only you know, twenty years later, to see him on the receiving end of an excommunication. What was that like for you to witness the guy who had been attacking you as a believer to see him get excommunicated? Well, I felt sorry for Quinn. Uh, I didn't feel to rejoice over that. Um, it was just part of that whole sad story of how everyone, it seemed like that the faithful historians for the last 30 years had been systematically cut off some way um, because they were too frank. And we we felt it was a, a great disservice to the community to, to stop all these people's research. So we didn't rejoice over his excommunication. We felt for him that uh, his own people had turned on him. I mean, here's and reading through the book when I got through, I thought this poor guy, he wanted to be the greatest uh, Mormon historian and the greatest defender of the faith. And that very effort is uh, the one thing he was cut off from really fulfilling. He did his best to tell history the way he saw it. And even though I disagree with some of his conclusions, he was being true to himself on trying to write up the church history, and I can respect that in him. And I felt for him that his own church didn't value him more uh, as someone who wanted so much to be accepted by that community and have them not see his value. Uh, so I thought... It's a very sad ending to its life. I, um, I felt bad for his whole family that it it just he accomplished so much, and yet to end up alone in his apartment at the end, it, it was just to me very sad. Yeah, and I would just add, um, talking to his children, and and I agree that. All of the things you said, Sandra. The only thing I might disagree with is his children said, "No, Dad wasn't alone. Yeah, he lived in California, but we were in constant contact, and you know, we saw him at holidays, and so they've never thought of their dad as being alone. That was comforting for me to hear too, because, yeah, you know, just to know that he did have his very much uh, the love and the contact with his family. And and he was in, uh, communicating with the historical community, too. He was mentoring people. You know, Sarah Patterson, who wrote The September 6th and the Struggle for the Soul of Mormonism, she talked about being a graduate student at Claremont Graduate University and D. Michael Quinn coming and lecturing to them and how kind he was to her and encouraging he was to her. So so I do think we we can, as a community, take comfort in he he actually didn't necessarily see himself yeah. as alone. So that's that's <laughs> comforting. But yeah, the way the way he was rejected by the church and excommunicated by the church that he loved so dearly and he wanted to help by telling the truth about his history. That part yeah. is very tragic and it comes out throughout the memoir. Yeah. Did you ever find yourself puzzled, Sandra, by his continued belief after all he learned? And if so, how did you make sense of that? <laughs> Well, I guess people look at me the same way, but uh, the spiritual side of him was a very big part of his life, and he put great confidence in his spiritual experiences and prayer times when he felt confirmation of uh, his goals and direction for his life. So, 
uh, I puzzled how he could write what he did and come out the other side and say, uh, Joseph's a prophet of God. I mean, I go through early Mormonism and the magic worldview, and I don't end up <laughs> with someone that's a prophet of God. Um, I go through Mormon hierarchy, origins of power, and extensions of power. I, I didn't read volume three, so I can't comment on that one. But uh, I get through those, and it doesn't raise confidence for me. And In the leadership. In the leadership. Yeah. So uh, I don't know. How do you explain faith? How do you explain spiritual commitment? Uh I find it very puzzling, but then I know a lot of people say that about me. I don't know how you can be a, a Christian and uh, be researching and doing history. How can you still end up believing? So uh, I guess Mike and I both end up with the same uh, question to a lot of people. Why? So With your both uh, of you with your faith intact. Because we both yeah. still maintained our faith in God. Mm. And, and in Christ. And that's and a Christ. fun parallel yeah. between you and, yeah. and D. Michael, yeah. is you both yeah. will have maintained your faith in Christ until the yes. very end. Yeah. I keep thinking of this empty chair right here and wishing that Mike was still alive and that <laughs> this conversation was going on with him uh. here. Unfortunately, all we have is his book <laughs> to refer <laughs> yeah, to, but right. I think it would be fascinating if Mike was with us and could could have this conversation with Sandra now. Yeah, but that's the way history goes. You can read the same documents and come up with different answers. Mm. So. Yeah. Well, any other, you wrote down some stuff in that. No, that's, uh, in, that's good. Yeah? <laughs> yeah. So any... If you had to give a summary take on the book and a recommendation and anything else you want to share about D. Michael, what would your closing thoughts or comments be, Sandra? Well, I think if you're interested in the uh, history of Mormonism, the last 60 years have been an important period of Mormonism. And maybe you could say that about every period. I don't know. But um, the awakening of church history and the formation of professional historians dealing with Mormonism uh, has all has been that story of the last 60 years, the same 60 years I went through uh, deconverting. They went through uh, trying to resolve all those problems so people wouldn't walk away like we did. And I think that uh, Quinn's book is part of the story of that, the struggle of the church historians to tell the story the way they saw it, the way the documents led them, in spite of tremendous pressure from the their own church leadership uh, to squelch that very detailed history and give a smooth view that makes it seem that everyone always agreed with everyone. <laughs> and one thing you find in Quinn's book is how much of the different church leaders disagreed with each other. Uh, and I thought that was quite interesting. So I think it's if you're interested in how Quinn wrote all those fantastic research books that he did. If you've got his books, you'll want to read his story. I think it fills out the picture of Mike Quinn uh, f that you don't get from just reading his research books. So I thought it was fascinating. It helped me have a, uh, a fuller appreciation of Mike and a greater understanding of him and his efforts at writing, even though we don't end up at the same spot at the end. Uh, I in thought it all was, the same spots, but you end up in some of the same, same spots. Spot. We <laughs> all end up still believing in Christ and uh, and wanting people to uh, join us in serving God. Mm. So in that and sense, loving history and loving and history, and finding history yes. interesting, <laughs> right? <Yes>. Right? <laughs> yeah, but but it, the details end up a little different. <laughs> yeah, you know, so. there's two there's two themes that come out in this memoir. One is Quinn's life as 
a devout and for much of his life closeted gay Latter-day Saint man. Um, and what it was like to to be that person in the second half of the 20th century. And I love that yesterday, or you just released yesterday, the interview with Moshe Quinn, Mike's son, in which we delved into that aspect of Mike's life and that part of this memoir. And then I love that today Sandra's here <laughs> and we're talking about the other major theme in this book, which is Mike as a historian who's a pioneering a scholar of Mormon history in the latter part of the 20th century and into the 21st century. He's a pioneer in both these areas. And so today's episode, of course, focused on that historical side. And then anyone who wants to look at his life as as a devout gay Latter-day Saint man can listen to the interview with Moshe Quinn. So we, we covered both aspects, those two huge parts of Mike's life. So viewers and listeners, here's your homework. <laughs> Pull up Amazon right now and fill up your cart with the following. <laughs> Early Mormonism and the Magic Worldview. Uh, uh, Mormon or, hierarchy series. Mormon hierarchy, origins of power, and Mormon hierarchy, extensions of power. And then round that out with Chosen Path, the memoir, D. Michael Quinn, and Light Lighthouse. Yeah. Help me out. Um Lighthouse, uh, Gerald and Sandra Tanner, uh, despised and beloved critics of Mormonism. The biography of the Tanners is fantastic. Yeah. Too. And if you want to throw something else in, throw in the Leonard Errington biography. The Leonard Errington um, Diaries is the is the best one, which is his annotated diaries by Gary Bergera. That'd be a good read. That's a good reading list. Oh, if you want to dig deep, yeah. <laughs> and then hold it's out. Fascinating. And then hold out for the. Uh, the post manifesto polygamy book yet to yet to come yet to come by yes. Quinn yes <laughs> all right well Barbara okay. thanks for all you and your team are doing from George Smith on down <laughs> at Signature Books because you, uh, you know we wouldn't be able to be having all these conversations without the great work of you and and Signature Books and our great authors and, yeah. and great subjects yeah. of these yeah. books great. And Sandra, it's so fun to get you out of retirement. How does it feel to be out of retirement? <laughs> to have a homework assignment. <laughs> yes, from right. John well, Dillon. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's good. So, what's it like being retired? Have you enjoyed it? Has it met your expectations? Oh, it, I love it. Yeah. yeah? <laughs> yes. Do you want me to leave you alone? Would you like me to leave you alone? No, I don't mind popping in once in a while. It's just nice. Not to be required to pop in all the time. <laughs> I get to choose. <laughs> so, so uh, are you ready for your next assignment or not yet? <laughs> uh, well, it depends on how big the book is. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> okay. Maybe. All right, Barbara, we'll put our heads together and we'll come up with, with Sandra's next assignment. Fantastic. And she, she it's full and conformed consent. You, Sandra, you can either accept or reject this. No, okay. Is that all right? <laughs> all right. Well, it's lovely to have you, Sandra. Thank you so much. Okay. You're welcome back anytime in our studio. We love you. All right. Thank you. And Barbara, same for you. This Thank is like you. fourth or fifth time. Like I think the we gotta, fourth time. We yeah. got to keep meeting like stop and keep know. meeting like this. Thanks <laughs> Too again. many good books to talk about. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's have you back as soon as we have another book. Sure. All right. And thanks, for everyone, for joining us today on Mormon Stories Podcast. This was fun. Hope you liked it. Please comment. Please subscribe. Please like. Please share. If you want to become a donor, uh, please go to mormonstories.org. Become a monthly donor. We appreciate it. Thanks to Julia and Maven and Gerardo and uh, Brooklyn and our board for keeping all the wheels on the wagon. And please check out Benchmark Books. And uh, all the other great bookstores uh, around town support Mormon scholarship, support Mormon bookstores. What's the one in Provo with Brad Kramer? Um, so Written Vision and Pioneer Book in Provo. I know that Pioneer Book has signed copies of Chosen Path right now, signed by uh, Moshe, myself, and annotators. Um, and then also Ken Sanders is another great local bookstore in Salt Lake City. Benchmark, I know, has signed copies, so please support local bookstores when you can. All right. Thanks, everyone. Be good to each other. Be kind to each other. We'll see you all again soon on another episode of Mormon Stories Podcast. Take care.